the regular session of the City of Crescent City's City Council meeting. And uh, does our attorney have anything to report out on the closed session for RDA? We will then, um, could you please call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Council Member Westfall. Here. Council Member Shalong. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ania. Here. And Mayor Murray. Here, thank you. Donna, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? We'll move on to the consent calendar. I'll move for approval of the consent calendar items three through nine. You have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. On to communications, public comment. Any member of the audience is invited to address the City Council on any matter that is within the jurisdiction of the City of Crescent City. Comments of public interest or on matters appearing on the agenda are accepted. Note, however, that the Council is not able to undertake extended discussion or act on non-agendized items. Such items can be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on a future agenda. Any comments that are not at the microphone are out of order and will not be a part of the public rec record. After receiving recognition from myself, please state your name and if you're a city or county resident for the record, and public comment is limited to three minutes. Is there any public comment? Hi, my name is Amy Bradley and I live in the city. Ever since the lies put forth in the resolution to censure Donna Westfall back in 2009, I and others of the public have submitted complaints about ethics violations committed by and concerning Council Members Murray, Shalong, and former Council Member Slurt. Nothing has been done. The reason nothing has been done is because when the Code of Ethics was established, it was the intent of some of the members of this council to keep the power in the hands of those that want to control which ethics they care to enforce and which they care to disregard. In other words, use the Code of Ethics as a tool to punish Donna Westfall. I'd like to either see the Code of Ethics repealed because it doesn't apply equally to all of the Council, or see policies and procedures established similar to other cities where investigations are held and fines are levied. Right now, there's nothing the Council or the City Manager will do when constituents complain about ethics violations against them. Daniel Kelly and I demanded an investigation. Nothing will be done. Shalong and Murray can continue to lie and pretty much get away with anything they want. This is wrong. This needs to be addressed. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Barbara? Barbara Burke, Small Business Development Center, Del Nord office. I wanted to come to the council to, we'll give you a report next month when we have more data collected for 2011. But I wanted to come tonight to thank you because it's so fresh from an event last evening. We have 11 clients who are in what we call a flight or a program. It's, we named it 2011 Del Nord Micro Enterprise Program. There were 11 clients who worked for eight months they 
went to five business basics workshops, counseling at least once per month. They wrote business plans, financials, marketing plans, and so on. So the Honorable Mayor Catherine Murray came last evening to the workshop graduation ceremonies and presented the certificates. This was a program that people put into a savings account at least $50 a month, up to $1,200, and it was matched two to one by Wells Fargo, sponsored by Arcata Economic Development Corporation, and of course the SBDC. So that put in play around, what, 40-ish thousand dollars. 11 people are starting their businesses right now in um, a variety of topics, everything from urban farming to farmers market things I, I brought the list but I, I won't go through all 11 folks but they're very appreciative of the funding and the support from the City Council thank you so much thank you is there other public comment Good evening, uh, Dan Berry, Golden State Risk Management Authority, and we've uh, been with you. you guys. Have been in our program for six months, and we're up here just on a on a site visit. And um, I, my only comment is that uh, we've really enjoyed working with your staff, and particularly Laura Hebon, Ken McDonald, Deb Snodgrass have been very proactive in uh, working with us on claims, working with us on risk control, loss prevention, and implementing the programs we offer. And uh, if you had any questions for us, myself and Mark Marshall, our safety officer, are here, and uh, we saw it just happened to be a city council meeting tonight, <laughs> so we thought we couldn't miss it. We appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thanks. I have no questions. Just really happy to hear that, and um, I know that it's uh, we really appreciate um, the hard work that you guys have been putting into helping us make sure that our risk management is uh, above board, and and so thank you. Thank you, guys. I feel the same way, and I remember getting a newsletter. I don't remember if it was emailed or sent to us. I really like that, though. Okay. Is that well, mailed or sent? We... Um, it may have been in your in your box at the. Yeah, at the uh, That's where. It was. At the, Is it every few months that you? Every couple of months, and we dropped off some more today. Okay. And they're a little dated, and we'll have new ones. And, okay. Uh, Those are really nice. We've never well, thank had you. those before that I recall. It's thank nice you. to know and that you're. That's produced out of our office by us and so we we do our best you know that just made, made me think of one question will you give us maybe I don't maybe you don't do this but maybe some kind of an annual review that the council can actually uh, take a look at we have an annual report that's being printed published right now it'll be out in about two weeks and it's an annual report that talks about our finances well know, I meant actually in just in relationship to our city within the annual report um, because of the short time this year we won't have that but we do have some statistics I can share with you in regards to training site visits claims mm -hmm. you know all those sort of things recommendations we can share all those and I know we can share with Gene and uh, Ken and whoever whoever's interested great just let the council know that uh, been really good to work with and uh, I think right now we're in the process of uh, scheduling some trainings um, one for the council, you know, the ethics training that's coming coming up, uh, I think in April. Yes. And a few others uh, for city staff. So, um, very April uh, 26th and 27th, we'll have Bob Hunt, who's uh, an attorney that we work with, who will be coming up here and offering sexual harassment, uh, the mandated harassment, mandated ethics training. There will be multiple sessions so that your staff can do it, and it'll be a live training. I know we, we do offer it online uh, for free to all your staff. But we know that people prefer the live, the live meetings, and Bob does a very good job, so um, he's going to come up here and do that for you. Great, thank you. Thanks for making the trip. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thanks. Drive safe. Yes. Is there other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment. And for the record. Um, we intend to review both um, Rosenberg's rules of order on how to run meetings and our code of ethics once we um, get our new council member in. We had originally had it on the agenda before Mr. Slurt resigned and uh, we, were, we postponed it uh, until we get our new council member. So we will be reviewing the code of ethics. On to um, the housing authority item number, pan, uh, number 10. We'll adjourn to the housing authority. 
And could you please note that uh, all four members are here? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is there any public comment on housing authority matters? Seeing none, I will move on to the consent calendar. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Um, we have no further business, so we will adjourn from the Housing Authority and move on to the Redevelopment Agency. And please note for the record that all four members are here, and we had no, nothing to report out of closed session. And is there any public comment on the Redevelopment Agency? Seeing none, I will close public comment and move on to the consent calendar. I'll move for approval of the consent calendar for redevelopment. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. I'm, I'm under reports. I would just like to bring up that um, uh, I think. Uh, Mayor Murray and I both uh, forwarded some information to City Manager Palazzo regarding uh, the new legislation that's being uh, reviewed regarding redevelopment um, in our agency and how it impacts our cities. And so I would just like for this council to um, approve directing um, our city manager to send those letters of support out and to stay on top of that. Yes, yeah. they were. Yeah. Um, I was just going to do that under legislative matters, but it, we can do that now. I figured it's since a, it's redevelopment. Right. So if the, all council is in favor of the direction? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank so you. be it. Thank you. On to item number 12. Public hearing. This is to conduct a public hearing for the appeal of the Planning Commission's decision to deny a variance to construct a six-foot fence within the si side yard setback and a four-foot fence within the front yard setback, setback on property located at 215 A Street South. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to ask uh, our associate planner, Eric Taylor, to take this item. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> As you already alluded to, this is a, an appeal of the Planning Commission's decision at the November, November 10, 2011 Planning Commission meeting. Uh, the applicants had applied for a variance for, uh, to retain 45 feet of a six-foot fence within a side yard setback and 62 feet of a four-foot fence with, within a front yard setback. Uh, the property subject property is located within the CZR1B zone, which is Coastal Zone Residential Beach District. So it's a... Uh, Probably the most restrict restrictive zoning we have in the city as far as um, fence heights and hedge heights and that type of thing. And the reason for that being is to, to preserve the kind of the view along the coastline and have more open space along the coastline. Uh, and I'll just read the uh, under analysis, under B, the fencing standards state that fencing, no hedges, shrubs, or fences between houses may exceed four feet in height. And the side yard setback, front yard fences may not exceed two and one half feet in height. I would refer you to attachment C, which is the aerial photo of the property, and that indicates the areas of the six-foot fence and the four-foot fence. And so what we did uh, for determination of the front side yard, we kind of went the way the house is oriented, looking at the front entrance. So that kind of uh, east property line there, kind of southeast property line, we determined to be the front yard and the side yard there, uh, that actually facing in between the houses. And that actually allows for a higher fence standard in between the houses, actually. Uh, again, it's in the CZR1B. Uh, this does not require a, a coastal development permit under the, there's a 10% rule if it's less than 10%. And residential property, including fencing, hedges, that type of thing, doesn't require the coastal development permit. Eric, are we, um, is this Exhibit C in your PowerPoint? It's not moving along. No, in the report itself. Okay. I just it's just, it's hard to report. see the actual yeah. picture in the report. And I thought for the public, too. So I, that's why I was asking. 
Um, I'll, and I'll, so kind of going over the basics there, I, well, I'll, I'll go back to the planning commission meeting itself. And I guess I'd like to go over some of the, the arguments that were posed. And, and one, as I put into the report, uh, approximately three months prior to the construction of the fence, the applicant had contacted the city asking what the standards were for that zoning. Uh, we kind of gave them wrong information at that time. We gave it for the CZ, uh, just a regular CZ R1 district, which is a little different than CZ R1B, uh, which does allow a six foot fence. Uh, and I, I you know, didn't really think about it much since then. Uh, but then I got received somewhere in June, I received a, another complaint about some uh, <clears throat> unpermitted construction that was occurring on the property. I went out to investigate that, and at the same time, I kind of saw the fence post laying in the, in the driveway there and some holes that were dug at that time. There was no fence had been constructed or erected. So it got me thinking again at that time. And I went back to the office and, and looked at it again, and went back to applicants, let them know it was in the CZR1B and what the standards were. Uh, again, there were some emails back and forth uh, saying, well, we permitted the fence, but we don't actually permit fences. We don't require fence permits. Basically, all we do in that case is we just we look at the, the municipal code because it's online. Anybody can look at it, kind of getting the information off of that. Um, <clears throat> again, and the next day uh, after the fence apparently was started to be constructed, uh, one of the neighbors had come in to complain about the fence and was inquiring about it. And I had asked at that time, well, how far had they gotten? And they said they were about halfway at that time. Uh, the other argument that was posed was they were having problems with one of the neighbors. Apparently, there were some issues going on with the neighbor, and I would allow, let them address the, those issues. Um, to my knowledge, that person no longer resides at the property, the, the person in question. Uh, the other argument that was brought up, and you can look at some of the pictures back in the staff report, if you go along that CZR1B, it really only encompasses a few first houses there. Uh, closer to the lighthouse and as you look pretty much everybody there has a six-foot fence out on the street uh, so the kind of the argument was that well everybody else has a six-foot fence then we should be allowed to have a six-foot fence that's not really what a variance is for I mean just because everybody else is breaking the standards it doesn't allow you permit you to, to also break those standards and actually, one of the, some of the direction I got from the Planning Commission was they actually wanted me to go back and look at seeing about bringing everybody into compliance, maybe having everybody remove their six-foot fences and bring them into compliance with what the current code states. Um, so you guys have been handed some additional photos, and I just have a quick little PowerPoint here that I'll give, just give them some photographs of the property. So this is looking down, if you're on, uh, out on the street looking down the driveway here, here's the subject fence. This is the four foot section here, and then around the side, I was more photo showing the, this is kind of it being constructed. Here was the existing fence on the neighbor's property. Yeah, Eric, can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. Uh, the white fence, mm -hmm. is that considered a side yard or a front yard? That would be considered a side yard fence. So that's the, uh, that's allowed to be four foot. Correct. Thank you. And, and that's one of the things that comes up here. It makes it a little difficult because the subject property is a flag lot. So if you notice on the aerial photo, how it kind of comes, there's a thin thing that comes down the driveway and kind of opens to the flag. So when you look at the other properties, they face out on the street. So if you look at the street frontage, we would consider their front yards, and then this would be the sides and the rear of the property behind. And the fence that was built in the cedar or whatever that is, is six foot? Uh, it's four foot at that location along the driveway here. And you can see how it's four foot and wraps around the back here. And there's a six foot section actually right back here. Here's the subject property. This is the neighboring property here. Okay. Again, here's a, another picture. So that, that six foot fence then is actually the person's front yard where it's supposed to be four feet. 
That one there, the six foot fence? Correct. And we kind of made this determination. The code's not straightforward about determining front property lines, side property lines. It just says from a, a street or a place. Mm -hmm. So I actually made this determination to allow them to actually have a little bit higher of a fence standard in between the houses. I mean, looking back on it, really what we should have done, this actually should be called the front property line right here. It should be a line like the other properties, which really only allowed them to have a three or two and a half foot fence. Because the houses are... We probably should amend the code to put that in. I'll probably amend the code and have that put in there for flag blocks because they, they can pose problems. So the bottom line is what size should this tall fence actually be? Four feet. Four feet for the determination okay. we made and then two and a half feet along the side. And my other question was, I know that you said there was an email um, that he received from us stating he could build the fence. All stated, well, and then take it would basically we would just read the municipal code. I was just forwarding on what the municipal code said. Uh, the secretary sent the email. I didn't personally send the email, but I, I might have told her at the time. But she sent okay. the code for CRZ1 and not 1B? Correct, for the okay. 1, not 1B. And then how was he given the code for CRZ1B? Uh, same format, and actually, and then talking back and forth. Um, like I said, I, I was actually on the property that day. I mean, I saw the posts in the driveway. They weren't, the posts weren't even in the ground at that point. Okay. But you did give him a copy of CRZ-1B prior to construction? Correct. Thank well, you. not a copy of the code, but I'm sure we had, I had emails that we'd sent saying th these are the standards, saying like we, we sent them originally. This is the height. This is what the code says. And you talked to him in person as well? Uh, it was probably through email. I may have talked to him in person also. I mean, it's been a while. Did he respond to the email? He, he did respond, basically saying, no, I, you already permitted the fence. I'm asking you to change your, to please change your mind on this. But basically what I informed him at the time is we didn't permit the fence. I'm just telling you what the code says. All I can do is just enforce what the code says. There is no permitting process for fences. Okay. Thank you. This is looking out the neighbor's living room window. So looking out the ocean there. This would be again from the kitchen window. And this would be from a little kitchen area, eating area they have, out the other direction. And that's all I have for the photographs. Now, one thing I'll add, if you look back on the Planning Commission staff report, there are no recommendations from staff. I basically left it up to the Planning Commission to make determination. Let them take the evidence and come to their own conclusion. And they unanimously voted to deny. And the variance, the variance process is to request a variance of the zoning prior to constructing the fence. Yeah, to keep in mind, this is an after the fact variance. I mean, that's what we're asking for here. Mayor. And Eric may want to expand a little bit when looking at variances or specific, you know, criteria within the code, state law that that uh, talks about variances and why they should apply to certain you know situations. Correct, and you have to make certain certain findings. Uh, one of the findings basically is that you know other property owners have some rights that this person is being denied for whatever reason. It could be topography or different things like that, but we really couldn't, couldn't make those findings. Um, Eric, I noticed that the applicant explained that he and his wife were being harassed by their neighbor and they needed six foot fence. Did, was there any expl explanation as to what kind of harassments were taking place? There, there was. I, I, I can elaborate or I can allow them to. Yeah, I don't know if that. I don't think that's appropriate. Okay. Yeah, on, on you know this application before us, it's you know specifically on the merits of zoning um, and variances. You have to make you know specific you know findings on, on their circumstances on the property. If there's you know civil disputes or something going on between the neighbors that you know that, that's really not in know, our the form might have to address that. It's not under our jurisdiction. So again, I'll just go back to the Planning Commission findings are there, uh, recommended City Council action, conduct a public hearing, receive comments on this appeal, and staff recommends you uphold the Planning Commission's decision to deny the variance. I'll answer any questions, attorney, at this time. Any 
Questions for clarification? Policy matters. Would you like to hear from hearing? I'm in a, since this is a public hearing, I'm going to open up this uh, to the public for public comment. So again, please come up, state your name, whether you're a city or county resident. Keep your um, comments limited to three minutes, please. Public comment. Can, wait, I, can you wait? To, my name is Karen Belsma, and I live at 215 it. South A Street, and we have the property for which we are appealing um, the variance the, uh, that wasn't given to us. Um, my husband and I are having a problem right now. We have, tomorrow morning we're going to court um, to solidify a restraining order and a contempt of court order against that man sitting there Ralph Murphy, he is not supposed to be within 10 feet of me or my husband. And I understand that this is a public hearing, but I think that he is still in violation of the law. And I also think, I also think that his appearance here um, after almost six months of stalking us and a great amount of money that we've put out to have him removed from the residence next to us prevents me, certainly, and my husband from being able to present our case right now. Um, we've prepared very carefully. We are out over $3,000 already on putting this fence up to protect ourselves. It is now a criminal matter. Ralph Murphy has been arrested. He is not supposed to be within 10 feet of us, and he is in this room. And um, I'm asking um, that he uh, either be removed from the room or that you schedule this for another time or when we can be allowed um, to have the uh, wherewithal to take care of this, uh, at least present a decent case to you. Uh, my husband and I have paid a severe emotional toll. He has threatened, and this is why he was arrested to wrap us up. It's a criminal issue. It is no longer. Okay. Well, uh, it's not something that I feel we can present fairly to you at this point. Can we ask that he leave you the room? Hold on a moment. Before yes. you go any further, let me check with the chief. I believe yes. he's checking on the restraining order and whether or not he has jurisdiction. And could you please just? Yes. I'll go sit down. Okay. Thank you. So, have you found out anything, Chief? Before we go to the extent of removing an individual from a public forum, we need to go ahead and confirm as to whether or not restraining orders are still in effect. And we've checked it through the Sheriff's Department, and there's no restraining orders that are there right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, you may come back. I wanted to find out the situation. So as you heard, there is no restraining order in effect. So anyone is allowed to be in this room at, in a public forum We like have this. a temporary restraining order. It has been delayed time and again. It stands as an authority. And tomorrow morning, we will go to court to have it made permanent. But it is a restraining order it is valid he was arrested under that the very same did you just hear me say that the chief checked to see if there is one and um, he found out that at this time that there is not a restraining order if I go home and I get it and bring it back will you look at it I'm telling you I should know I'm, I'm sure I don't dispute chief plaque at all I admire him very much but there is a mistake being made here there is a mistake being made here. We have a restraining order. That's why he was arrested. It hasn't been rescinded. We'll take a 10 minute recess. No, 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 no. It's 10 feet. She said it was 10 feet. Okay, so you could go over there and be 10 feet away. He has actually already violated it by coming in the room, but yes, we could do that, I suppose. If you think 
that it's fair to subject us to this. He has nothing it, to it, add. He's no longer this is living a public there. meeting. Okay. We're required to allow people to participate in the public process. If I go home during your 10 minute break, I, I don't may I get the restraining order and bring it's it up back? up to the council to, do you, you want to continue? Chief, if she actually has, uh, has it, uh, what, what's, what's the process? There was a re temporary restraining order initially, as what uh, Karen was saying before, and he was arrested on that as well. Now, that was several weeks ago to a month ago, as far as that's concerned, I have no way of finding out other than contacting the Sheriff's Department, which we did, to see if there is a restraining order. If they have something for the restraining order tomorrow, that's when it makes it uh, uh, permanent, so therefore then we can act on it. But that's and not until. The council has just asked of 10 feet is the restraining order, whether we're talking about a temporary or a permanent right. restraining order. This is a public forum, and it's very, difficult to re have someone removed here from that. So therefore, if one could sit on one side of the uh, form and the individual sit on the other side of the form until this is addressed, that would be perfectly fine by us. However, uh, there's no permanent restraining order okay. or any restraining order that we can find through okay. the first department. Okay. I would like permission for 10 minutes to go home. The temporary restraining we, order we just I misunderstood, excuse me. I misunderstood what Council Member Shalong was suggesting. She was saying 10 feet. I thought she said 10 minutes. I was going to get a consensus from the Council. But at this time, it doesn't appear that the restraining order is in effect. So you have your choice on how you want to handle it in terms of staying in the room, moving, right. or leaving. All right. I will go home and get it and come back. No, we're not going to continue. No, you, you just can. My husband is here. He can present the case. I will show Chief Plack that that temporary restraining order is in effect until it is made We're permanent. We're going to continue the hearing yes. whether you're here or not. Yes. Thank you. I agree to that. And thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Okay. So other public comment. No other public comment? <laughs> Give them to her. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Roger Gitlin. I live at 225 South A Street, Crescent City. I appear before you tonight to recommend a denial of this zoning ordinance variance, excuse me, as requested by applicant Bilsma. As you know, the item has been previously passed and denied by a five to nothing vote by the City Planning Commission. <coughs> applicant Bilsma is no, not someone who is unfamiliar with these proceedings, nor is he unfamiliar with code requirements, ordinances, and application of the law. In fact, the applicant sought to sanctions against our application for a variance to construct a 50 square foot shed along the side of our home approximately a year ago. <clears throat> it seems ir irreconcilable to me that this very same applicant seeks enforcement of recognized laws on one hand and comes to this council seeking forgiveness on the other hand. Selective enforcement goes against the grain of anyone who has taken a sworn oath of office. The concept of forgiveness is not <clears throat> new or novel. The applicant must answer and justify this council while he ignored a city cease and desist letter to complete his non-conforming fence project. Now applicant awaits the anticipated approval of his variance request. Instead of giving acknowledged credibility and the appropriate sanctity of the law to which he now seeks relief, <clears throat> instead elects to ignore the very applicable laws to which he seeks enforcement against others. Such conduct is certainly not the proper course of action that merits reward through the Planning Commission or now through you, the City Council. For over two decades, <coughs> neighbor Mary Weir has enjoyed ingress and egress from her backyard to the easement driveway. This illegal fence now prevents Mrs. Weir 
from accessing her driveway. California real estate law states open and hostile use for a continuous period of five years makes the easement permanent and the affected party, <coughs> Mrs. Weir, is now landlocked within her own property. There is another reason to deny applicant Bilsma request for variance. There existed a prior fence, a very nice, attractive fence, about two feet high, white picket fence. This fence that has been constructed over a prior fence, I can only describe can you wrap as that, a please? spite fence and one it's, which is certainly not neighborly, and I recommend you deny his variance. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment on this topic? Madam Mayor, can we ask some questions during this public hearing? Well, let's wait until all the um, public comments have been made, and then we'll ask. Um, good evening, uh, City Council members. My name is Angela Gitland, and I have lived next door to the petitioner for approximately 16 months. Last summer, Mary Weir, who is also my neighbor, told me that she was going to extend her 30-inch white picket fence around her home to connect with the white picket fence on the other side of, side of her house in order to ensure the safety of her dog and to keep the dog in her yard. I said that I thought that that would be a good idea and that it would also look very nice and an enhancement to the area. As soon as the construction started, the petitioner, Mr. Bilsma, objected strongly and proceeded to build a fence around Mary Weir's fence. The fence that the petitioner erected is um, a one, in one area is over six foot and in another area is four feet. And in my opinion, it's also an eyesore. The fence that the petitioner built uh, doesn't appear to serve any purpose. Uh, to me, as Mary Weir already had an attractive white picket fence. I've also been in Mary's house um, since this fence was erected, and it blocks many of Mary Weir's views to the ocean. And in my opinion, that is just very mean and spiteful. Twelve months ago, we wanted to erect a shed down the side of our house, which the petitioner, Mr. Bilsma, also objected to as they said that they were very concerned about the aesthetics and the ambience of our little area because there's like three little houses there. They wanted to keep it pristine and very beachy looking and they felt that our shed would uh, uh, detract from that. Anyway, um, now they've gone and built, a, in my opinion, a very big ugly fence that most definitely detracts from our area and covers the beauty of Mary Weir's home. And it also deprives Mary Weir of the views to our beautiful ocean. I hope that the city council will compel the petitioners to remove what I also call a spite fence and deny their request for this variance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other public comment on this matter? Hello, I am Mary Weir, lives 205 South A Street. And uh, I think it's pretty well already been covered. But my personal feeling is one of anger. I run a business there. I run a bed and breakfast. And this summer, I've only had three people that were brave enough to stay there. They, they come in, they take one look at that fence and don't see an ocean. The city also is winning. I pay my tax, my 10% bed tax. And you didn't get anything from me this year. This, this fence is ugly. It's hurtful. It's like living in a cave. I've been there for 21 years, had no problem with any of my, my uh, neighbors. And this has got to come to an end. It has been illegal from the get-go. The back is 
back fence is sitting on cinder blocks, which makes it another 12 inches higher. So it's actually a seven foot fence between me and the ocean, the whales, the birds, the sunsets. I didn't take notes, it's just from my heart. We have been fighting this since July. It comes to you people, it comes to other, the, uh, so many people have been put out by this silliness. They keep them pushing for more and more hearings. It's, it's so, so taking up everybody's time. It's got to come to an end. I asked for that fence to be taken down. I don't have a, a, a gate. No gate. My gas man comes and he has to go through my garage to get to my tank. And every time that a big truck comes through there, something is damaged. Ernie liked to blame it onto me, but it wasn't me, it was the trucks. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Robin, it feels like the air is on. Yeah, it's chilly. My name is Ernie Belsma. I'm the petitioner in this case. I've prepared some documentation for your benefits. This is something that I was not going to be planning on using, but I'm going to let you have this. Can you give it to our clerk, please? Can you speak into the mic, sir? This is a set of arrest records for Murphy in, the, in our backyard. Uh, it's not the only reason we're trying to get do a fence, but it's one of the reasons. Sir, can you please can you give, give them to our clerk? To the clerk. Thank you. So while she's passing that out, what I've attempted to do is address the issues at hand is the reason why we're trying to, to get a variance on the fence. Uh, what has progressed? I have a number of photos that I've placed in the uh, in here. It's kind of a photo package. Had I had an awareness from Mr. Taylor that you had a, a a method for me to put that on the screen, I would have done that so that we could probably all uh, have a, a easier thing. At any rate, the request that I have here is a request for fence height various to You need to speak into the mic so we can record. Okay. Thank you. You got it? I'm not used to this, so you just have to put up with me. Okay, is a request for fence height variance to achieve conformance and parity. I think that what we're attempting to say here is that if we looked at all of the houses on A Street, they all seem to possess six foot fences. Well, isn't that something? So what we have here is, is a guy that's putting up a six foot fence on a flag lot, and there's more controversy about a flag lot than, than we could probably spend all night about. Now, Eric there, he would tell you that, that he's, we're having a, a favor by having a four foot fence and calling that a side yard. It's really confusing. And I'd like to unconfuse it for us. What we have. You only have less than three minutes now. When the red light goes off, you need to wrap it up. E even, even being the person that's involved in this, I get three minutes to, to talk about the, that's it? We're consistent uh, with everyone here. Okay. So the bottom line is we, we receive from the city that, uh, that the city says was a mistake. Okay, can you wrap it up, sir? I'm sorry. Yeah, that we up. received an approval to build the fence from the city, and we proceeded to do that. We had the six-foot fence 
finished when he came by to look and see where we had a four foot fence. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'll believe this. Is there other public comment on this? Seeing none, I will bring it back to the council. I understand there are a few questions. Uh, Ms. Westfall, you'd like to go first? That's for staff, right? All right, well, the problem I have with it is if I were being harassed, I would want to be able to construct something to feel protected. But on the other hand, we're, you're saying we have to uh, remain within code. And if we're just talking about code, I find the white fence very cute and attractive. Uh, it's a discrepancy with the six foot fence. All right, so apparently we do have discrepancies in our code and our code enforcement. And um, if I bought property down at the beach, I wouldn't want a six foot fence blocking my view and that's where I stand. I have, I have a question. Sure. Mr. Taylor, I just want to make it clear or make it clear to myself. When you went back there and uh, emailed him to stop, the six foot fence was not up or was it up? It was not up. There was not up. The posts were actually laying in the driveway in the post hole. That's what kind of got my mind going again, thinking about it. I don't have a dog in this fight. I have no reason to. Okay. Maybe. I just wanted to make that clear. Did you, in fact, send a cease and desist order? I think it was just back and forth on email. Okay. And then I, after, after the fact, we sent him a letter saying, hey, look, you can't have this fence. So. Kelly, do you have a question? Um, well, I had. The cease and desist letter that was mentioned so i was we hadn't been provided that so i was going to ask you if there really if, if that really existed um and then i i was concerned about um somebody saying that mary weir didn't have access to her driveway and she's landlocked because of the fence can you show it that's can, what i, I was yeah about that. can you show us the picture that shows where she can't get to her driveway I don't know if she kept out of her driveway. We'll go back. She said backyard. Yeah, I think it was take it out of her backyard. No, no they, they Mr. Gitlin, yeah. I believe, said that uh, she has no access to her driveway and she's landlocked. Right, I heard that so too. So the driveway, her driveway's right here, actually. In front of the house. But I think what they were talking about, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, in order to get to her heating oil, I think it's back here somewhere. And then she has to go through the garage. I have a way to get to that. I guess it used to go back there and they've now been blocked off. Who's, whose access is this? Is that a driveway? Sorry, the- Right here? Yeah. Yes, yeah, a shared driveway. <laughs> sure. This is a shared driveway that goes straight back to uh, uh, the applicants live back here, and then also, obviously, the residents in front there share the access to get to this driveway right here. And before this wooden uh, four-foot fence was built, the people who delivered the propane could drive down the driveway and go through Ms. Weir's property to get to her tank? Is that? That's what I've been told. Okay. I mean, I can't verify that. I've never seen it. Myself. And now they can't. That's what I've okay. been told. So. Okay. And this is the four foot fence that he erected? Correct. So you see four foot and then back. You see right here in the corner where the six foot starts. Okay. And then this fence was in existence prior. Um, oh, and then where the six foot um, fence is, uh, the zone uh, says that it can be four feet, correct? correct? Correct. Okay, so if he were to take it down to four feet. See what it says, you have a four foot fence in the, in the side yard and a two and a half foot fence in the front yard. But this, and this is, but this is Mary's house in front? Correct. Okay, so this four foot fence is not his front yard? Right, that's what I'm saying. That's a driveway? That's what I said. We, made, we kind of made a determination for him to allow him to have a larger fence here. Because actually, if we, re if we really looked at the right way for a flag lot, which a lot of jurisdictions do, they would look at it as the same alignment as the rest of the properties. 
the rest of the properties all front onto A Street out there. So that would be their front of their property and side sides back. So if we looked at, at that the same way, actually if you come around on the flag lot, so right here with a six foot fence, you would really consider that the front yard. Two and that's and really a about two and a half. But instead we made an exception and since he enters into his property, that front of his property faces that direction, then we called that the side, we allowed that to be the side yard. Because the front faces this way? Right, the front of his property faces towards the lighthouse over that direction. Okay. Okay. So, our, the st so staff's determination on the property line actually is benefit, as far as the code goes, to allow them to have the four foot fence between the property lines and not a two and a half foot fence. I fail to understand why there's even a four-foot fence on that driveway. Is that a question for me or? Uh, yeah, that's a question for you. Okay. But, uh, but I, what you're saying is you, no, go ahead and answer it. I'm not sure what the Well, it, I think it just, I mean, it doesn't make logical sense to build a second fence down the driveway, mm -hmm. I think is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, well that's just what happened. Okay, I, that, I don't have any more questions. Yeah, I, I guess I could clarify that a little bit. Um, if you look back out on the aerial photo, the, the driveway is actually part of their parcel, but they have a shared easement that allows both of them to access it. So there's a separation of the parcels right there actually. It is, is the white fence on Mary's property? That's on Mary's property. Okay. And so the wood fence is actually on the applicant's property. Which is an easement. Correct. But they both own the easement? Well, I guess I don't know what the actual easement says. I mean, I don't know how far her, I would imagine her, her you know, access. I don't know. I mean, at least she has access to her driveway here. So I've never looked at the easement to see what it says. Okay. Well... But the easement itself isn't being blocked. I mean, you can still drive yeah. down the driveway. Yeah. It's just the gate access for the refilling of the gas tank. Correct. Yeah. Well, I'm sure all that will be determined by someone other than us. Yeah. <laughs> so we're here on the variance request. And um, I think it's really unfortunate that a group of people who live in such a beautiful part of our city are having trouble agreeing with one another and can't be uh, good neighbors to one another. Um, what's that poem, uh, fences make good neighbors? It's certainly not like that here. And I, I find it, I'm hard pressed to see how any of the fence that was built um, without, a per, without the uh, proper height really protect somebody from person living smack next door to them. Obviously you could hop over the fence and walk, walk down the easement driveway to do more harassing if you were so inclined. But I really would like to see the neighbors uh, try to work this out and say you're very blessed to, to live in such a beautiful part of our city. So if you could try to work it out and get along, that would be really nice. Um, do we have a motion for the um, request for the variance? Well, I was just, I would just like to make a final comment in that um, obviously there's a lot of emotions going on, a lot of personal stuff. Um, unfortunately, that's not our job to um, help you work out the civil issue. Um, I, I think that um, it's a, there are a lot of mis, uh, unfortunate things that happen. The fact that we gave erroneous information in the beginning. Um, the fact that a lot of the neighbors have six foot fences where they shouldn't have six foot fences. Um, and the fact that um, a variance was applied for after you built your fence. So all of those things um, don't work in this forum. Uh, the fence was built against our zoning regulations. Uh, and unfortunate, it's unfortunate that um, happened, but we can only make a ruling based on what our code says. 
Right. I'll make a motion that uh, we uphold the Planning Commission's decision and deny the variance. Second. With the recommended findings? Yes. Okay. Could you please pull the vote, Robin? Yes, ma'am. Council Member Westfall? Yes. Council Member Shalong? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Ania? Yes. And Mayor Murray? Yes. And we hope that you guys can work it out and try to be good neighbors to one another. So for anyone listening um, live stream or when you watch this on Channel 4, please remember that um, you can't get a variance after the fact. We'll move on to item number three, 13, I'd rather. The Front Street S-Curve Funding Recision, S-Curve Design Allocation and Allocation for the Combined S-Curve Front Street Construction Match Funds. Mayor, uh, Eric Weir will uh, do the presentation on this item. Mayor Murray, members of the council. Hey, Eric. How are you guys? Good. Good. All right. So yes, as you mentioned, this is in regard to the uh, to the Front Street project, as well as the A Street to Front Street S curve project, both of uh, both of which your city staff has been working on for uh, well one project for a little bit longer than the other. Uh, that one being the A Street to Front Street S curve project. That project was approved by the City Council and uh, funded by the Del Norte Local Transportation Commission in 2008. We have currently started design. We were working through the uh, somewhat drawn out process of acquiring the right of way. I believe all of that is, has been completed. Uh, to refresh your memory, it was an S curve project that basically was going to allow traffic to go from Front Street to A Street in a basically a non-stop pattern using uh, using some s curves to take you around the corners and really allow you to for the traffic to flow down to pebble beach uh, here's an aerial look at the current situation that we currently have which basically if you're coming from a street trying to get to front you stop here at at a street and and second here and you have to stop again at b and second and then stop again at front and b the proposed project would basically take this and make some smooth radius curves allowing traffic to flow freely onto A Street. Uh, also incorporated in this project is numerous pedestrian improvements. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just remembered that I have to recluse myself as I own property there on 2nd and B. Oh, sure. Oh. Currently, this project is funded. Uh, through RSTP funds for the construction, which is $275,000. The city's match for this project was for the right-of-way acquisition, as well as the design and construction management in the form of city staff time. As I said, we've currently worked out all of the right-of-way acquisitions, uh, including the $5,000 for the last remaining piece, which we have currently in the, in the city's budget. The second project that we're currently working on is the Front Street project. This is a very exciting project uh, to be working on and I think exciting project for the community just in general. Uh, this project is at 90% right now. And so as we were, as we were working through the project and some of the details, uh, one of the, the key interaction points was the B Street roundabout in which this has a direct influence on the design of the A Street, 2nd Street, Front Street, s curve project that we just talked about. So in looking at the funding for Front Street, we have 275000 of RSTP funds to fund the design, which we're currently almost complete with. Uh, we're going to, uh, to need some right away to complete this project as it's currently planned, and that's in the form of about $50,000 is estimated. Uh, currently, that's unidentified where that, where that funding is going to come from. Uh, we do feel confident, though, that once we receive the grant for this project, there's a possibility that the city could be reimbursed for that funds. Construction for this project is estimated at right around $4 million, of which about $3.7 million would come from a grant, and then the city would be, would be uh, pressed to come up with the remaining match amount, which is estimated about 10% or 370000 uh, Currently, our, one of our options, our strongest option, would be to approach the Del Norte Transportation Commission and ask for that funding amount to be uh, given to us in the form of RSTP dollars, and then city staff time would be necessary to complete the project. 
As we were working through this, we, uh, we're trying to keep the momentum going on this project as well as some of the positive momentum that we have around the city with all of the parks projects that we've been able to keep going. So we approached Tamara Layton as, uh, as we knew that this, this sort of the, the big elephant in the room was going to come about and we we're going to have this nice project and the plans were going to be done and specifications done and it would sit on the shelf until we received funding. Uh, so in talking with Tamara, she came up with a very uh, innovative funding strategy. Her idea was to combine both projects. So we'd end up with the Front Street project, as you see here, rolling into our S-curve project. What this does is we currently have 275000 for construction for, for this part. If you wrap them both into the same project, this allows us to use this construction money for basically match funds. Uh, you can see the interaction between the two, where this is the roundabout at B Street, the S-curve then rolls into 2nd Street and rolls onto A Street. The, uh, so if you look at the total funding of this project, the, the combined both projects, you have the design for Front Street, which is 275000 already allocated by RSTP. What we'd be asking for was to rescind the 275 that is currently allocated for construction of the S-curve. Give us $30,000 to the consultant that's working with city staff to design Front Street to incorporate this S-curve project into the Front Street project and finish the design. City would still be responsible for approximately 55,000 of, of right away, which is the right away required for Front Street as well as the S curve. And then we'd ask for a $4 million grant to cover both projects, leaving us with a $400,000 of RSTP money that we'd be uh, requesting from the Transportation Commission for match. So comparing the two, you have separate projects. Can you go back one, please? Sure. So design, okay, so we already have the 275. So we have the 275. For design of Front Street. For the design of Front Street, that's almost complete. So what would we be asking the... Okay, but where's the 275 that we were going to use for the S-curve? Well, that is in the form of this 30,000 as well as this 400,000. So we would basically be asking the Transportation Commission to rescind the 275 for construction. Putting it... And to apply it to the 400,000? And to apply it to the 400,000 plus 30,000. So if you look at it as a, as a complete picture, your two funding strategies are, are this. The, the separate projects as it would stand now so the, so would basically require $920,000 of RSTP money to construct the A Street to 2nd Street S-curve project that we talked about for the match of the Front Street as well as the design of Front Street. So you'd use $920,000 of RSTP. If you go to this current funding strategy, which combines the two projects, you're now using the money you would have spent on construction at 100% of the construction cost and applying that to just the match portion, which is 10%. And why do we have to rescind the money if it's going to be added to the 400000 It's It's going to be used in conjunction with it. I think it's just that money was allocated for construction of A Street. So That's basically a it's, it's, a, it's, it's a separate complete project. So you need to put that back sort of in the pot and then reallocate it in this manner so and that it goes towards design. those funds don't become available? Those funds are available right now and they would, the nine, they would basically... The 920? Well, the 920 is in the, is in the current. Would be... <laughs> the the 920,000 is, is all of the funds combined. It's looking at it as a, as a total picture. So the 275 is already allocated and sort of off the table for the construction of, of A Street to 2nd Street. The 275 to design Front Street is also off the table. So there's 550,000 that's, that's basically spoken for at this point. We would then need to find the match for Front Street, which that's another 370,000. If you add them all up, it adds up to 920,000. So that's the, that's the 920. What we're asking the Transportation Commission to consider is combine both projects. The 275 to design Front Street's already spoken for. We're asking for an additional 30000 to design, finish the design of the S-curve and incorporate it into Front Street so we have one project. So now you're at three hundred and five, And then we're going to ask them for a match of 400000 of RSTP funds for the match of, the, of both projects to cover our 10%. That gets you to a total of seven hundred and five, basically saving uh, approximately a little bit over $200,000 of our local RSTP funds that's very valuable to any transportation project. So in a whole picture, this is really saving money as well as a way to get both these projects completed. And the grant money? Grant money. 
that's the other uh, elephant, so to speak, in the room. Uh, $4 million in grant money that we're going to need to find so that this project doesn't just sit on the shelf. At, during the last Transportation Commission, which was last Thursday, they approved to allocate the city an additional $4,000 of PPM funds, which is planning, program, and monitoring funds, to go along with the 10500 that we currently have. Uh, what this would do is this would basically fund a uh, third amendment to the Drake Hagelin contract to have them aggressively go out, review all the funding sources, and put together grant applications such that we get this money. And, and that 14 grand would come out of the RSTP money? No, the 14, 30, 000? 14 grand comes out of a, a, a different pot of money. It's called PPM money. The city currently has in its, in its current budget 10500 They would give us an additional $4,000. We have to use this money on planning, programming, and monitoring type expenses. Uh, the commission, Transportation Commission. Okay. Is it possible to not call this the S curve project? Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, everybody in Del Norte County knows the S curve is the S curve. Let's call it the B yes. Street curve. You got it. I Something, like it. I mean, you know, it's just, I think it's a little confusing. I still like the side yeah. to raise them. <laughs> and, you know, in reality, it's really just going to be the front street Curve. rehabilitation, yeah. you know, and improvement projects that now, you know, includes this escrow from A Street to Front Street. B Street transition, or, yeah. I mean, second, something, second you know. street realignment, yeah, yeah. you know. What a like tsunami that. way. She probably has, she has a good point, I think. Yeah. Everybody's going to think we're changing the S curve. When I first Not thought, yet. that's what I thought. I thought what are we doing with one. the S curve? Not yet. It works for Caltrans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know uh, Tamara Layton from the uh, executive director of the Local Transportation Commission is also here. I believe she'd like to, to speak towards the project. And sure, the please. Council has any questions? Thanks, Eric. I read my agenda and then I left it at home, but I have my computer, so don't worry. Um, if, if we could go back to the funding strategy. I'm sorry, you're going to have to run this for me. Um, the prior, there you go. So under the separate projects, the RSTP design construction match of $920,000, um, the funds that have been um, set aside for this area of projects um, is not $920,000 at this time. I just wanted to be clear for you all in the public that this is the city's idea about where they might go to get match funds. But the commission has not been requested those match funds and in fact, we don't have that much money in the RSTP account at this time given the allocations that we currently have to the city. So as an option, the $920,000 according to my, my knowledge and my spreadsheet in front of me, is not a viable option when you combine it with the other projects. Um, the, the Front Street is the second priority project in the regional transportation plan right now, with the first priority project being traffic calming on Highway 101 at the gateways to city, the city of Crescent City, the gateway areas, um, because we have people dying there. And so, um, I came to the city staff with this proposal with the idea that it's my second priority project and it's my job to do it until it's done. And um, I'm just trying to figure out a way to make it work. Um, but when I take a look at this, the city's presentation and the knowledge that I have to date, um, I just want to be clear that when, we, when I look at the proposed funding strategy and if, and if the local transportation commission, who is a decision-making body, I am not, comes back to this project I, my staff recommendation to them will be that there are safeguards on these funds to ensure that the project is delivered, you know, within a specific amount of time and within some specific guidelines. So um, if the Transportation Commission were to make this request, my staff recommendation to them is going to be that we would have, a, for example, a project's charter that laid out some sort of ground rules for the funding and that, you know, the funding would be used for construction match, that the, the funding um, by legislation is a reimbursement funding, so there would need to be some kind of explanation for how the reimbursement works, that the project, until the project is complete, all of the 
funding would not be allocated to the city until you know the whole project is signed off on as complete because that's what you know in my understanding the local transportation commission would be um, seeking with this you know significant amount of RSTP funds this is you know according to the allocation that we get this is a significant amount of funding and um, we must keep in mind that the Transportation Commission is different from the City Council with regional transportation priorities. So I just wanted to be clear to you that my staff report and, and my staff recommendations are are this proposed funding strategy and that we you know sat down together on several occasions and we worked this out in a way that we think it is going to work for the community but there are some unidentified funding areas like the fifty five thousand dollars of right-of-way acquisition that I, I don't know where those monies would come from but I uh, GF means a general fund I, I understand that but then but it's sort of a heads up to you that you know if we could move forward in this way and if we were fortunate enough to get the four million dollars in grant and if the Transportation Commission prior to that um, set aside the four hundred thousand dollars for the match funds that the city's still going to have an obligation to the project and that obligation might come in the form of general fund dollars or some other funding source that may not be Transportation Commission funding source so I, I just, you know, I wanted to be sort of clear that this isn't completely solved right now and um, that the Transportation Commission is a combination of county supervisors and city council members and public comment. And so it's, you know, it gets complicated when you get from here to the end of the day. Right. Um, I understand everything you just said but I'd like clarification. You're saying that RSTP, RSTP dollars are refundable dollars. So the city puts out and, uh, the dollars ahead of time and then you refund them if, if it's approved. And you're saying that you do not reimburse until the project is complete, the which could be three to four years down the road. I, I understand that. And so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that none of the 400000 would be spent to reimburse the city. But if the city had $4 million as a grant funds and the $400,000 were matched, then the city has, you know, potentially $4 million or $4,400,000 to spend on this project. So there's, you know, a lot of money in the bank. But it, it's true that um, if the city gets an invoice that they need to send the invoice to me to reimburse them for the invoice that happens very quickly once I get the invoice from the city um, so it, it's not some you know big long-term drain of four hundred thousand dollars on a project for you know a great deal of time but those kinds of details would be laid out in a project charter so at the end of the day we're not surprised we remain good partners throughout the project everybody understanding what their obligations are and you believe your staff report would recommend that um, or that a priority in your decision-making process is that the city already have that four million dollars identified before you decide to fund um, my recommendation is that the Transportation Commission might I anticipate my recommendation to the Transportation Commission will be that the that the Transportation Commission set aside the four hundred thousand dollars knowing two things that the city's going to need 10 percent match funds and that this is the second priority project in the regional transportation plan so it's about our regional transportation priorities and looking down the road and saying, okay, what do we have coming and how can we accomplish our goals? Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Very creative in, in the solution. Um, and for the public, in case um, you don't know, the right-of-way acquisition is for um, carving out pieces of property along uh, A Street to 2nd Street and then uh, Street. around the, the curve that we've just renamed. Correct. Okay. Yes. So just yes. <laughs> the A Street alignment. So. Kelly Drive. No, just kidding. Other questions from council for clarification? So, okay. I just wanted to get uh, our city manager's input. On this whole concept or what was uh, the concept that you, you know, if it's smart for us to rescind the two hundred seventy five grand to hope to get 400000 to match the $4 million grant we don't know where we're going to get. 
and you know, putting together large projects like this is you know, pretty complex. And you know, I think this you know, idea and the solution is very creative. I, I think it does gives us gives us some flexibility in going out there and, and aggressively pursuing you know the four million dollars, um, and that'll get you know this four hundred thousand you know of our STP funds will give us you know that match. Um, I've dealt with a lot of different projects. Yeah, you know, it, it it will it, it takes time for all of it to come together, and it will and it will take time for all of this to come together, and you know have that definite you know commitment of of funding sources. We just need to continue to chip away at it, and this is you know the direction that you know we'd like to take it th this time. Um, hopefully, we can uh, get creative to find that four million. And Eric, I'd like to see um, you guys come up with some, all, uh, I, I don't know, get, give us some information on where the other dollars might come from that the city is going to have to come up with. There's a the 55,000. I think there'll probably be more than 55,000. Are you, you but talking about uh, for the land acquisition or the? Um, for the whole project. For the whole project. Yeah. And that, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to you know, enter into an agreement w with the engineering firm to um, help us because they've been very successful in finding different finding dollars money. out there. Um, the 14 grand. That's yeah. correct. Correct. The 14,000 for the funding acquisition. Mm -hmm. And I've spoke with Howard Michael, the uh, the principal from Drake, mm -hmm. Aglin, uh, several times about this, and he did feel confident that in a lot of grants they will actually reimburse the city for the right of way acquisition. That's where it's really an unidentified funding source. So the general fund might initially pay for it, but the hope being that the grant would actually reimburse us. Um, we went over this sort of this project outline from design until finished construction, and we tried to account for all the all of the different costs. You're right. There, you, with things like this, you never know. They, you know the sort of the uh, the truth lies beneath sometimes, and especially with the front street, we'll have to account for some of that. Uh, Construction management, as far as hiring an outside consultant to help city staff manage the project, will also be covered within the grant, they felt. So, uh. well, and I think that in particular, Front Street in itself is going to be an unknown. And so, I think that's, you know, I, I can see the change orders coming in. Um, when they say, "Well, we found another redwood tree," that <laughs> uh, yes, there'll there'll be some. Um, fortunately, with Front Street, we are aware of a lot of those possibilities, so we're really trying to address those up front, uh, and, and so a lot of those unknowns will be covered in the specs itself. Okay, good. Okay, um, we don't have it on the agenda, but I'll open it up for public comment. If there's anyone who would like to make a public comment please come and state your name if you're a city or county resident and limit your comments to three minutes public comment on this topic I guess my comment is more in line of a question um, <clears throat> I was wondering uh, will any private property be compromised uh, during this renovation period <clears throat> and I'm thinking specifically that's a vacant lot there sir yeah it, it, um, you address us and uh, yeah. then I'm um, just asking for those that are in the know what the okay. the compromise would be to public property and also what um, is envisioned on that vacant lot which I guess would be the equivalent of B Street or 2nd Street there's Alexander and daughter uh, um, um, the uh, vacant uh, seafood place, which is kind of a blighted area. I mean, what is the vision for the city? What's going to be there? Um, that's more of a line of a question rather than any kind of, kind of comment. If you have any information, I'd like to know it. Thank you. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, well, yes, and that the, the private property that you're that you're talking about is the the right of way acquisition that we would need to construct the B Street roundabout. Uh, the roundabout cannot be constructed within the current right of way, so there will need to be some portions uh, taken from some of those lots. You can see this map here represents the uh, the portion of that lot that's on B Street and Front Street that will need to be taken, as well as small corners from from the Westerly intersection as well. Um, and so also we, up on A Street and, and Second. And then yes, this, so this portion has already been acquired from the city, which would be the 
would be the southwest corner of 2nd and B Street, and then there would be the northeast corner of 2nd and A Street, which we're currently in the process of finalizing the details on. Uh, as far as the use for that vacant lot, the use and, and zoning hasn't changed, so it will remain the same. Is there other public comment on this? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the council. We have uh, recommendations here. I move to uh, direct staff to proceed with uh, the requesting um, process to the LTC um, to consider um, rescinding the 275, allocating the 30,000, and then uh, requesting the allocation of up to 400,000 of RSTP funds to um, help with a match for the Front Street, B Street project. Okay, we don't really need a motion for a directive, but. Are we all in agreement then to move forward well, with the recommendations? It's all money, so that's why it's I made not a motion. motion. I'd request that we do a formal motion. Okay. I'll second that motion. Thank you. Could you please pull the vote? Yes. <laughs> Council Member Shalong. Um, you know what? I should probably also include, I'm sorry, item two. We, we approved that already at the Transportation Committee Thursday, right? The $4,000. Uh, I was just going to say to uh, my motion, if I could amend it to um, authorize the city manager to son sign contract amendment number three in the amount of 14481 uh, to help with the funding acquisitions. Second. Thank you. Okay, so we have another uh, motion on the floor, and we'll hold the vote for that first. Yes, ma'am. Council Member Shalong? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Enia? Yes. And Mayor Murray? Yes, thank you. Motion carries. And thank you, Tamara. Mm -hmm. yeah, On to item number 14, which is um, consider two resolutions for the city council um, regarding the RDA. So our city manager will fill us in. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council, good evening. Uh, the item before you, what we're requesting this evening is the adoption of two resolutions. Resolution uh, 2012-03, uh, uh, which would be electing uh, to the, for the city to become the successor agency to the redevelopment agency of the city of Crescent City. And the second resolution, 2012-04, uh, would be electing the city to retain the housing assets and functions uh, previously performed by the redevelopment agency. Uh, why we're here this evening with these resolutions is based on the decision of the Supreme Court uh, uh, at the end of uh, 2011 and you know, their decision on ABX 1X26 and 1X27 was uh, basically they dissolved um, all the redevelopment agencies throughout the state of California to become effective on February 1st, 2012. Uh, now, I want to comment on uh, next steps. The, this is a very fluid and moving process. There's a lot of legislation and bills being introduced uh, out there right now that, you know, by the end of the month, uh, things could very well change. Uh, at this point, we need to move forward with, you know, what's um, required, you know, by the adopted legislation. In a sense, what this means is that uh, this uh, city uh, would become the successor agency uh, to the redevelopment agency and it would be governed by an uh, oversight board. Uh, the oversight board would consist of seven members and this is, you know, per the uh, state regulation. Uh, those seven members would include um, two county boards of supervisors, the mayor, uh, county superintendent of education, uh, the chancellor of the California Community College, uh, largest uh, special district um, taxing entity and a former employee of the redevelopment agency, uh, which would be appointed by the mayor. And can you just briefly explain to the public why we this oversight board was chosen this way? Yeah, actually, I you know, don't know the details. Uh, it was based it's set up in the state legislation, so the yeah, For, but because they're part of the taxing. And, and that, yeah, and they are part of the taxing entities, uh, and um, 
think I see see where you're going with the question. <laughs> <laughs> the um, it, redevelopment and the tax increment. Uh, typically, cities or agencies have um, agreements with the different taxing entities. I believe we have seven or eight uh, uh, tax entities within the city, um, mainly the school district, you know, some special districts. Um, and when agency dissolves, you know, the, the different assets, you know, loans, liabilities will um, eventually the, the taxes will go to those different agencies. So, you know, these agencies are involved with the, the dissolving of the redevelopment agency. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Uh, with that, the um, oversight board would be involved uh, with the dissolving of the agency. And in the staff report, I outlined, you know, the different city assets or the agency assets, uh, which includes outstanding uh, debt obligations, um, uh, property assets that the agency owns. Uh, some of this is still in flux on you know what you know eventually happens you know, with, you know, those loans and the assets the, is anticipated in working with the oversight board uh, to um, pay those uh, debt obligations and then also to retain uh, the, the agency-owned uh, assets uh, that uh, are used for city facilities. Um, there are some other uh, receivables out there, uh, loans to different, um, you know, businesses in the community, and those again would you know, go back to uh, being uh, part of paying off the existing debt of, of the agency. Uh, the housing funds uh, at this time, you know, and with the adoption of the resolution, the city would be uh, basically responsible and, and receive, you know, the housing assets. There is some um, legislation in place to uh, really strengthen and uh, firm you know that the city is uh, would be uh, receiving all unobligated assets that you know, are part of the housing set aside funds so and uh, right now we w what we're asking is to adopt these two resolutions um, once these resolutions are adopted I'll be contacting the taxing entities I'll send them a letter letting them know, you know what our process is and what the state law is requiring us to do, and I'll probably as the you know, things evolve, come back uh, at additional meetings and update you know, the city council. And if we need to do additional resolutions, we'll do that as well. Thank you. Any uh, clarification questions for Mr. Palazzo? <laughs> that was a good report. Thank, Thank you. you, especially considering the fluidity of the situation. So. All right, we'll open this up for public comment. Do we have public comment on this matter? Is everyone confused? <laughs> it's a pretty complex situation. Mr. Roberts. Kirk Roberts, I live in the city. My only question is, does the city directly go on the hook for money owed by somebody in the brewery uh, who is no longer around? and? Yeah, will the city end up having to absorb that loss? We actually, they, they actually don't owe us money. They were given a... Um, tri agency. They were given a, yeah, they, have a, they had a tri-agency loan, but the city gave them a lands, if I, I'm trying, this is like back of my memory, but I believe it was a landscaping grant um, to do the landscaping in the front with RDA funds, but I believe it was a grant. The loan itself was I think was it was like 30, 15,000 or something like that. So no liabilities exist on that property that would accrue to the not for the, back on the Not city. for the city except for the fact that we fund the tri-agency every year and the tri-agency really lost out. <clears throat> Mr. Renfro was here and left uh, before <laughs> yeah. I had a chance I, to I ask. I think he went out, he's outside talking to Tamara right now, I think, but. Sold to Blue, Blue Top Marine. They did buy it. They're buying. And they bought it and they're, they're buying dealing it. with the SBA through that. Yeah, they're doing that. So there's no city or RDA no. RDA money involved. No. Okay, thank you. 
other public comment? We got a little bit into answering. Yeah, sorry it. about that. Um, is there any other public comment? Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. I unregrettably move to uh, um, adopt resolution 2012-03 and 2012-04. I'll second that. I'll second that motion. Okay. Robin, could you please pull the vote? Yes, ma'am. Council Member Shalong. Yes. <laughs> Council Member Westfall. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Ania. Yes. And Mayor Murray. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, on to. Item number 14, the council vacancy appointment process. Hello. Dispatch. Yes, ma'am. So as it states in my uh, staff report, this just basically gives you an overview of what's going to be happening within the next week at your direction in regards to the applicants that we have. Um, if we were to hold a special election, and that is one that's outside of the June election that we would contract through the county, it could count, cost the city in excess of $20,000. That being because the city would be required to not only purchase all of the ballot material, but also the equipment necessary to run the elections, as well as the staff necessary, because I'm your only person responsible for the elections. <laughs> So as you guys decided uh, that you wanted to just hold a council appointment. So uh, before you is the process on which it would take to do so. Um, we were talking about possibly having it doing a numbering system amongst you guys deciding on uh, perhaps what, who the two candidates be that you would choose. You would turn the ballots into me and then I would let you know who the top contender is for you to make your decision. Uh, and then if you would like to hold that on Monday, January 23rd at 5 o'clock. Um, I believe that we cannot do a ballot system uh, when you appoint. I believe it has to be a public vote um, that has to be taken. And We were talking about that, uh, Bob and I. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, it does have to be a public it vote. Does. There's no, no secret ballots allowed, but you could do a numbering system right. where the points add up if, if that's how you choose to Could you explain a scoring explain matrix that? certainly um, I think what we were deciding to do and you can help me out with this one but basically what you would do is you would have like um, your candidates being let's say you like this individual the best so you would give them a five each one of you would have a card that you would rate what that person is openly you'd give that to me and I would just decide based on the numbers that were given to that person who your candidate would be like who that the has top to be selection. public information correct sure mm -hmm. yes yeah and, and then we would then we would vote on the candidate exactly and, then, mm -hmm. and that public no, she's saying we wouldn't vote then we could vote though. well I would oh, think no, that we, it would need to be by a vote still have to have a motion mm -hmm. yeah regardless of exactly of what happens there needs to be a motion and a pulled vote rich and I ought to know <laughs> <laughs> okay so there'd be a vote then right okay. so you would add it up and say okay uh, I'm just gonna pick the top name Joseph uh, got the most points so right. then we would then make a motion to exactly accept. and then see if that was carried with and all those, the votes those scoring cards are public too yes any, anything the council does in this is, is all public information any scoring mm -hmm. have your name on it and, and what the vote is and you could just keep it very simple and you know have the list of names and you know vote one, <laughs> yeah you know top candidate you know the second top candidate and you know Ms. Patch could you know tally those and let you know you know who you know who got the most you know X's next to their <laughs> name. Um, yeah, it, it we do have seven candidates, so it could be you know four different you know people um, that may require some discussion by the council. I'm not. At that I'm point. not following you. No, just if each one of us gave a different individual the highest mark. If each one had a different individual high mark, you may have some problems with then that have to have a system. Then you have to have a discussion on that. Does that make sense? Sort of. I've been through this so many times, and we've never done scorecards, so it's. How, how would you, how would you like to? No, I'm just I'm just trying to learn. I don't because I've I've never heard of it before. So. Would well, you like me to elaborate on why we decided to do that? It was just in the interest of making it a little less. 
kind of like more objective. It, well, yeah, and it also doesn't make the candidates feel like, I mean, it's, it's healthy to be arguing amongst, you know what I mean, to say, hey, no, I agree with this person. But it just makes for a more smoother process to go along. If you have a numbering system, then you already know, okay, well, it looks like the majority of the council likes these two candidates, these four candidates, then this is who we need to focus on. Instead of one per person making a motion and everybody disagreeing with it, then going to the next person. Oh, but I, I, I'm uh, about 100% certain that you did have a scoring matrix because, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things. Want to think. <laughs> uh, I have a question on that 20,000 special election figure. Yeah. Who came up with that figure and is it from 5,000 to 20,000? Um, well, can we have some more specifics about that? Sure. Um, well, as we all understand, and it's no secret, our county clerk recorder's office is the one that holds the elections for us, mm -hmm. and we do not have any material. There's only the only best resource that I would have locally would be to go to Elisa Northrop to get that information on how much it would cost for all that equipment, and that's a, that's a prudent way of looking at it. It's always best to err on the side of um, caution when you're talking about city finances. Um, if it was to go to an election to where the county could do it for us, which is more than likely what would happen, mm -hmm. yeah, we're talking about just maybe between five and ten thousand dollars. However, if it wasn't to go that route, wouldn't it be better for you guys to know you're not just looking at five thousand dollars, you're looking at a possibility of twenty thousand dollars. Because if I was to tell you this is going to cost you ten thousand dollars and then you get a big surprise in the check that it's going to be more than that because we need the staff, we need the materials, we need the machinery, so hence the 20 I have a hard time thinking it would only be $20,000. That is very conservative actually, I mean, because we are talking about maybe even twenty-five to $30,000. Well, but you're talking about having everything done in-house mm -hmm. versus contracting with Alyssa Northrup, the county clerk's office. Mm -hmm. Right, but So wouldn't it make more sense to get like a a uh, contract bid or something so we knew exactly what we were talking about? It was you know, be to, three or five, 5000 for her to do it? Well, we already know that if she was to do it, how much it would cost based on past elections. Because like last year when she conducted the elections for us, the city council was presented how much that was going to cost. Therefore, you know how much that's going to cost. When it's in regard, and that's why that's easy for me to say that it could be this much money. In regards to this large amount of money, the reason why it's easy for me to say that is because Elisa and her office has already been through this. They have all the stuff that's necessary. They go through the vendors every four years, every two years, however often they have to do their elections. Yeah. Therefore, it's, I mean, it's, you use, we use our local people on every level, not only for jobs, but for information. Because this is a person who understands locally what we're going through. And I could call the Secretary of State's office, but it's always easier to contact the local representative for that information. And the, the um, other matter to me is that it's a real short term uh, until the election in November. Exactly. And we need to operate with the full council in order to make decisions for the city. So I feel yes, it's better to have someone in the seat as an appointed official Absolutely. and then they can run or everybody else can run too mm -hmm. um, in November and it's it's not that much of a time frame. So. Well and I, I think it's a, a tremendous, you know, um, getting people to run for city council <laughs> isn't that easy to do. Um, you know, I mean look what we've gone through, recalls and you know, all kinds of issues and you know, when you when you run for for local office, you have no idea that you have to become a um, an environmentalist and a wastewater treatment plant operator and uh, you know I mean the list just goes on and on and, and budgeting a five you know million plus dollar budget and making those hard tough decisions and pleasing half the people and making the other half upset and you know it's a, it's a tough job so to have somebody actually be able to sit there and uh, you know have a real good feeling of is this for me do I want to run for this office I think is a, is a good thing well and if I may I just want to tell you guys that it was incredibly exciting to me not only to go this has been on the job training for me I mean all the way from being a deputy till now and it's very exciting but what's more exciting to me is seeing this caliber of people that you guys have before you that are interested in serving our community which yeah. is amazing and it okay, is a huge blessing I had another question am I missing something because what I have in my packet is seven 
applications for the appointment. Um, no, ma'am, that's separate, and that was in an envelope for you to review until we have the meeting. So if I have questions that concern all the applicants and it's not on our sh checkoff sheet, what do we do about that? Well, I would think that, of course, that's up to you guys, but if I would think that if there were questions outside of the established questions that you guys have, if you guys speak amongst each other and decide that you're okay with that, then that's, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to we, ask those in the questions. Past, in the past, I believe, the applicants came, I mean, we read their applications, um, but then they came to the podium and they just basically we interviewed them spoke and then we were able to ask them a few questions yeah and what's really sad for me Donna is that when I looked back at the minutes unfortunately for me I have to just rely on the motions that were made there was no unfortunate description on exactly what process you guys took so I had to rely on people that had been there and done that what about take information um, yes audio? there's probably I well, I'd like to say there was audio I'd hope that there'd be audio but I wasn't here so oh, so once but, again what is the process are they going to be interviewed or are we just going to have a sheet to fill out or both well that's what you guys will be doing is you will be interviewing them and you will be ask, asking okay. any questions that you have at the end of that process you'll be tallying on a sheet of what you score them as And for, so what I'm understanding is this score sheet is just to kind of give us uh, direction as to who the top two or three yeah. candidates are mm -hmm. for us to discuss amongst the public about before we take a vote. Yeah, this is all, all a recommendation. So right. we're asking the council, you know, I think there's four items here that we need to decide upon, you know, the date of a special meeting. Uh, the time, you know, the time allotted. Uh, if you want the candidates to speak, you know, we're you know, recommending 10 minutes uh, for a candidate to do a presentation and then also um, figure out some sort of process on how you want to either score or do you want to, you know, just discuss the candidates, you know, at the end of the meeting and, and come to a conclusion. I mean, that's really up at, to the council's discretion and we'll assist in. in in that whatever process you would like to do happen but we're supposed to ask each candidate the same questions and correct and uh, if there's a follow-up something that they mentioned then to answer Donna's yeah. question about correct. a follow-up question you, you can do that but you have to ask each candidate the same, same question que if you want to ask questions of the candidates, they need to in order the to be fair and I think there's some uh, procedures where um, it is a public open meeting but the candidates that have not been interviewed yet need to wait outside. Right, and exactly. Be asked to come in. Well, I would like to have the opportunity to review the applications um, and then submit questions that I think would be fair to all candidates. Because the there might be a common theme. Yeah, and the um, you know applications were provided to the city council this evening. Yeah. Um, for your review, and then at whatever direction we can. You know, gather questions and, and put those together. Just you know, when would the uh, when would the applicants get the questions? You would ask them at the interview. Yeah, at the interview. Yeah. So we okay. You know, it's your discretion so again. So there would be a deadline to submit questions of what? Would, yes, absolutely. I mean, we we need to, some time to put them together. To the staff. Well, we it would be a short turnaround if we interview on the twenty third, yeah. which is Monday. Right. Yeah. If we got <laughs> five questions from each council member, you know, we'll be here. A while <laughs> you know, you'll be asking so you know, that you may want to limit the number of questions or you know uh, you, I'm sorry to interrupt Ed, were you going to look and see if, what questions we had asked previously I, I looked you couldn't find anything. Uh, yeah the agenda binder is um, a comprised of maybe four pages okay two of which being the agenda itself two being minutes and there it was just a series of motions. Okay. So. The information we had was, um, I think the the uh, applicants submitted a questionnaire that right, resumes we did is. with the resumes, and those questions were asked of, you know, the last time we you know went through this process. So those were the same consistent questions that were you know done the last time. Don't know how the uh, process was held, you know, at, at the interview uh, stage. Um. 
Well, I just want to thank all of you for applying that are here in the audience and if you're watching live stream or channel four, um, it makes, um, I think it bodes well, very well for the city to have that many interested applicants and that mm -hmm. you all bring different strengths to the table. So thank you very much. I a thought about questions. If uh, we have questions that we'd like to ask, maybe as you read them, you can email them to us and maybe some of the questions are very close to being similar so you wouldn't have to ask a question that I might have or one that uh, our mayor might have. It might be close to being the same question. I think that's what Kelly said. Yeah, we could uh, get questions from the council by a certain date and then, you know, we... Um, Do you want me to... Patch and I, we can put them together and <laughs> sit down with the mayor and just maybe come up with, you know, four to five, you know, the top questions, you know, for the council to ask. Do that. And are you going to provide those questions to the applicants ahead of time no. so they're prepared? No. What, whatever your direction is on that. I, I don't think do. that. You don't think what? That, well, we already have a questionnaire that they're filling out. When you're in an interview, you don't come in and know what the questions are going to be. Well, isn't this a Sorry, guys, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's like a, a mayor? cheat and cheat. Yes? Will each individual applicant be up by themselves mm -hmm. um, and the rest will be out? Yes. Okay. No. They're yes. allowed to be in the room? No. no they weren't. I was no. never allowed to be in the room and the two times I was I had to wait outside. <laughs> I think the interviewees remember a little bit more. Because the questions, uh, they, they want to make then sure. Then you'd have time to think out. If You can stay after you've been interviewed. If Mr. Holly were the last one, then he'd have all kinds of uh, good information that he could start building a better answer. And the first person. So how are right. you? I don't know about that. Yeah, have a um, yeah. I was no, we don't. Yeah. We, um, as part of the yeah. process, we can request that in order to make it as fair a process to all the candidates that everybody, that we do interview one at a time so that, you know, it's fair to everybody. Mm -hmm. However, legally, we cannot exclude anybody from yeah. a public meeting. Exactly. Um, but I would think the candidates probably understand the spirit of the request. I don't, re I don't remember that before, though. Well, I do. I do, too. <laughs> I had to wait I'd outside like to until it was my turn. I'd like to go back to the audio. I don't think there's a need to go back to the audio. I remember it. Yeah, I, I, I can go back, but if I'd like to. Thank you. But we, we both went through it twice, so we know. Yeah, okay. I, I was on this side. Can I ask of where they held in the in the board chambers here, or was no, it? No, they were held at the cultural center. Cultural we're, center. We're okay, to. so that's going to be via audio tape and I do have a box of audio tapes in my, I will do my best to locate one. I cannot promise you that there would have been one. Okay. So, what does the council's uh, pleasure here? Oh, one looking? more question. Is there anything wrong with any one of us or all of us talking with these applicants before their interview? Um. I would uh, discourage that just because we want this to be an open public process where if anybody wants to see what's going on, they can come to the meeting and witness it. If you're having private conversations outside, then um, obviously the public can't witness it. Um, if, if you do have any communications regarding this, um, those should be disclosed at the time of the special meeting. Um, I don't think it's really in the spirit of the process to have out outside communications. Okay. Are we looking for a date for this? Or yeah. Um, what's your pleasure? I'm available Monday for a meeting. I am too. Okay. Yeah, the, the items we need is date, you know, time, time allotment per candidate, candidate or applicant. And then um, if you have questions that you want you know, to ask, and then the process, uh, you know, after the you know, applicants have um, done completed their presentations, how would you like to present your choice? How would you, you know, want to do a matrix? Do you want to do a ranking? Do you want to just have a discussion amongst the council? Well, after my one experience, um, I think we should have a scoring matrix based on the interview questions and the 
supplemental questionnaire that was turned out, I think that's um, much more objective and uh, open. That's my prerogative. That would be mine too after going through it twice. Do you want to ask, uh, would it be okay for a Thursday deadline for any questions since we're going to have the meeting on Monday? In consideration for staff, yes, please. Yes, Thursday? Yes, please. Okay. I'm just concerned that four or five questions is not going to be adequate. With the, if I may, with the um, information that you have before you, a lot of them have submitted their resumes. You also have to take in consideration that we're requesting that you guys consider 10 minutes per applicant. Um, and if you have more than those, you're not going to really get as much information as you'd probably like if you know, just condensed it into a couple of questions. So are we good with um, next Monday, January 23rd at 5 o'clock here in the Board of Supervisors Chambers? Can we start a little earlier? I don't, I don't, is the board room The chambers are available because the LAFCO meeting has been canceled, but of course that's like up to four? everybody's availability. Mm -hmm. Like at four? Mm -hmm. Can we do four? That's fine. I can so, do four. So Monday, January 23rd, here at the Board of Supervisors <coughs> Chambers at 4 p.m., we will conduct the interviews for the City Council vacancy appointment. Oh, do you want to have public comment? <laughs> Public comment. Kirk Roberts, I live in the city. I'm chairman of the Planning Commission. Uh, the ex parte communications thing about talking to somebody outside of it. No, don't do it. And secondly, when the ethics question is being reviewed, when you have a full council, I seriously encourage you to look at what the Coastal Commission does in terms of ex parte communications. All outside communications have to be disclosed when an item is being addressed. And that should apply to the Planning Commission, that should apply to the Council uh, in open public discussion. If you have outside communications, you should be disclosing it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment and we will move on to legislative items. We have the letter. Uh, you're keeping up with the legislation that's uh, uh, coming forward from redevelopment uh, or on redevelopment and keep you up to date on any letters uh, or information that comes in. Also, we did receive an email from Ms. Creasy from the Redwood Empire outlining future dates uh, of uh, meetings throughout the year. I'll make sure everybody's received that. If not, I'll get that to you. Mary Creasy sent it to us. I have it all printed out here. Um, it was before. Um, anything else? That's all. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, Council Member, Member Westfall, do you have anything to report out? Uh, yes, I attended a couple of meetings in the last few weeks. Um, one was a meeting with Kevin Hendricks um, to learn more about the solid waste and to inquire about why our tipping fees are the highest in the state of California and how to reduce rates to the consumer, um, reduce payroll, and just a number of concerns that I had about it. and. I feel that one more meeting is required for me to feel comfortable enough to go into the next solid waste meeting uh, next week. Um, I attended a Democratic Party meeting uh, to ask two things, if they had an ethics, rules, or regulation in their bylaws and found out that they didn't, and to talk about the FSA, that um, the uh, toxic industrial waste that's going to be on the ballot November 2012 to see what the process was to um, inform them and was informed that their endorsement committee will convene in September and to go back at that time 
And then I had some concerns that I didn't follow up with a request for agenda items, so I'm submitting two. It's an either or. One is to repeal the code of ethics as currently practiced because it does not apply equally to all council members or to create a policies and procedure to deal with code of ethics violations made by constituents against council members because currently only council members deal with code of ethics violations and will not investigate violations leveled against them by constituents. That's it. Council Member Shalong. Uh, our airport terminal um, design, <clears throat> I'm on the airport terminal design committee as a board member for the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority. And um, some very exciting news. Um, last week we had a meeting at the Smith River Rancheria um, because legislation was passed to allow uh, a tribe to um, be a part of the, a joint powers authority. Um, and so that particular piece of legislation allowed Smith River Rancheria to join uh, the airport board. So we had our meeting at their new Talawa event center. It was very nice. Um, so now Kara Miller uh, now sits on our board of directors. Um, also, sitting on the Terminal Design Committee um, has been pretty exciting. We had another meeting today. The engineers are in town, and um, David Finnegan and myself and Commissioner Rhodes out of Gold Beach sit on that committee, and we're helping to make determinations on what it's going to look like inside and out and dealing with all of the FFA, um, I'm sorry, FAA. <laughs> um, regulations and looking at the funding and budgeting and it's a it's a really exciting project and um, so we just continue down that road I uh, also wanted to mention that this Saturday night is the Chamber of Commerce annual dinner and um, uh, January 28th is the Wild Rivers Community Foundation annual dinner um, just wanted to throw out there that they are having Jim Tunney as their guest speaker and Jim is a former uh, NFL Super Bowl referee uh, for decades um, really wonderful uh, motivational speaker if, if you're into that and then just want to say happy new year I hope 2012 is good for all of us thank you mayor pro Tamania I also attended the uh, airport authority uh, meeting with our uh, local tribe the seat and I also went to the uh, local transportation committee meeting last week and later this week I'll be going to Sacramento to the uh, public safety committee that I'm on for the League of California Cities and while I'm there I'll be um, contacting Assemblyman Chesbro and uh, Senator LaMoffa regarding our RDA uh, situation and also some other things for the city. Um, I attended the Board of Chambers annual retreat at the Requa Inn on Saturday, and it was a very productive uh, strategic planning process. So um, we have some lofty goals, and i um, looking forward to the annual chamber dinner on Saturday night. I, too, attended the Local Transportation Commission meeting and the celebration of the Smith River Rancheria um, becoming a member of the airport JPA. And um, last night I attended um, the North Coast Small Business Division uh, Development Center graduation with um, 11 uh, participants at, uh, graduating. And it was very exciting to hear what types of businesses that went from glass blowing, artwork to um, daycare. And all of the participants graduating had a positive uh, thing to say about what they learned in the classes they learned. Um, a business plan, marketing plan, um, your fiduciary responsibility. So they just raved about the class. And anybody who is thinking about starting a small business, um, it would behoove you to go through the Small Business Development Center. And I wish everyone a healthy, healthy happy, and prosperous new year. Meeting is adjourned until our special meeting on January 23rd at 4 o'clock here. And our next regular meeting is February 6th um, at 5 p.m. Closed session. Thank you.